We turn now to 2 Timothy in chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. This is the last chapter of this Paul's last letter. And we have been considering how Paul has been unburdening his heart to Timothy, whom he has given a charge to, to carry on the ministry which God had committed to the Apostle Paul. We considered in an earlier study how Paul says in Philippians 2 verses 19 to 21 that among all his co-workers he does not have anyone like Timothy who is faithful, who does not seek his own in anything, but who followed in the footsteps of the Apostle Paul seeking the interests of Christ Jesus and the kingdom of God first. And that's why he communicates to Timothy in this letter all that is in his own heart. And now he begins this chapter, verse 1, with these words, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead by his appearing in his kingdom, to preach the word. It's a sacred and a solemn charge that Paul is giving to Timothy something that Timothy would remember all his life, long after Paul had left this world and gone. That his father in Christ, his spiritual father, had given to him a charge, a sacred charge, to preach the word, verse 2, in season and out of season. That is, when it is convenient and when it is not convenient. And Paul emphasizes this charge in verse 1 by saying that he's making it in the presence of God. It's not something to be taken lightly. He's saying to Timothy, God himself is a witness to what I'm telling you now. I'm commanding you in the presence of God, in the name of Jesus Christ, to be faithful in preaching the word when it's convenient and when it's not convenient. And then he adds the emphasis of not only in the presence of God, but also in the presence of Christ Jesus, who is going to judge the living and the dead at the time of his appearing. In other words, Paul is saying, in view of the soon second coming of Christ, and is judging all people. In view of that, I charge you to preach the word. And this has an added emphasis in the days in which we live. We considered in our study of Second Timothy 3 that Paul speaks about the last days and about difficult times coming in the last days. And here, he carries on from there and speaks about the coming of Christ. In view of the coming of Christ, what are we to do in view of the coming of Christ? in view of the fact that all the living and the dead will one day stand before him to be judged. There is one responsibility that we have, particularly those of us to whom God has given the gift of the word. Preach the word. That's a very solemn exhortation. We are not to preach stories. We are not to preach illustrations. We are not to preach applications primarily, but primarily preach the word. Now this carries on from what we saw at the end of 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16, that all scripture is inbreathed by God, a God breathed, God's breath is in his word. And that's why when we preach the word, we can expect God's breath to go forth with that word because God's breath is in that word and to bring conviction the Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin, of righteousness and of judgment and so we are to preach the word if we speak our own words or our own illustrations of the word it won't have the same effect as the word itself and so we are commanded to preach the word. 
and to be ready to preach the word in season and out of season. And any one of you who has a gift of the word need to check your own ministry to see whether what you are preaching is the word of God or men's ideas about the word of God. There is no power of the spirit in men's ideas. The power is in the word. God's breath is in the word. So preach the word. And the other thing you need to check yourself on is this. Are you ready to preach the word at all times, in season and out of season, when you feel like it and when you don't feel like it? Never to lose your sense of urgency because the coming of the Lord is so near. Whether the opportunity seems to be favorable or unfavorable, be ready to preach the word and leave it to God to let that word bring forth fruit. And what are we to do with God's word in our preaching of it? We are to reprove, rebuke, and exhort. We saw that earlier in 2 Timothy 3 verse 16. That scripture is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and so on. And so when we preach that scripture, it must bring reproof, rebuke, and exhortation. We're not to preach smooth messages that tickle men's ears, that satisfy them, that console them in their sin. No, we are to reprove sin, rebuke sin, exhort people, as it says in Hebrews 3.13, exhort one another daily so that no one is hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is a deceitful thing. And all our preaching must be primarily directed against sin. Hence this emphasis on reprove, rebuke, exhort. Don't lose any single opportunity to reprove people with God's word. To rebuke people with God's word. And to exhort and challenge and encourage and stimulate them to a godly life with the Word of God. And he says that this must be done with great patience and instruction. That means with never failing and utmost patience, with all the patience that the work of teaching requires. With patience and with teaching. God's servant who teaches the Word must be patient because people are slow to learn. Jesus was very patient with his twelve disciples. They were very slow to learn some of the fundamental things that he tried to teach them for so many years. But he was patient with them. And therefore, he succeeded in convincing them. If we are going to be impatient, if we expect people to grasp the truth with one hearing, we shall not be effective teachers of the word. And so we need to Preach and teach with great patience. Because, he says, the time will come, and that time has already come in our day, when they will not endure sound doctrine. The word sound means health-giving. That which will bring health, wholesome instruction. That which will lead to spiritual health. It's a Greek word from which we get the English word hygiene. Hygienic doctrine, that which will keep us free from sin. People will not endure this hygienic doctrine that keeps us free from impurity and sin. But instead, they want to have their ears tickled. They want to hear stories. They want to hear testimonies. They want to hear illustrations. And therefore, they will accumulate for themselves teachers who will tickle their ears with stories and illustrations and testimonies and exciting Incidents that they relate. And these teachers will speak to them in accordance with their own desires. That's what we find in a lot of Christendom today. People have accumulated for themselves pastors, teachers and so-called prophets and apostles who are just teaching them that which they want to hear, comforting them in their sin, not leading them to a godly life, not leading them to purity in their thought life. And therefore, the people have turned their ears away from the truth, it says in verse 4, and have turned aside to stories. 
because they wanted teachers after their own lusts. People who would allow them to live in their lusts. And so they have turned away to faith in stories and testimonies. And that's the condition of a lot of Christianity today. Now there is a place for testimony if it's in line with the word of God. But we have to primarily preach God's word. And particularly in our day, when people's ears have been turned away from the truth. If they had heard the truth, like Jesus said in John 8, 32, the truth would have freed them from the power of sin. But they don't want the truth that frees them from the power of sin. They want to hear stories and illustrations and to be entertained. And so the prophet has gone out of the pulpit and the entertainer has come in to entertain God's people. And it is in this day that those to whom God has given the ministry of the word must stand with God's prophetic word, preaching, reproving, rebuking, exhorting with great patience and instruction.